Uh, member, it's our intention to re-refer this bill to Education Finance. Um, Rep Representative Feist, would you like to motion your bill before the committee to be re-referred to um, Education Finance, House File 1547? Yes, Madam Chair, I couldn't have said it better. That is my motion. Thank you. All right, Representative Feist moves House File 1547 before the committee to be re-referred to the bill, the, to re-refer the bill to Education Finance. Now that the bill is before us, Representative Feist, please introduce yourself for the record. And please proceed. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sandra Feist, uh, Representative 39B, member of this committee. Very excited to be presenting to you today the compensatory revenue bill. Um, so um, input has been solicited and will continue to be solicited. I'm really excited for this conversation we're going to have today about this important bill. Um, so compensatory revenue um, is de designated funds to help students who are underprepared to learn and not meeting academic performance standards. Um, to give you a sense of scale, um, in the 2023-24 school year, um, there is an estimated $763 million um, in compensatory revenue, um, which is 8.1 total of the statewide general education budget. Um, this proposal is to get us um, to 100% uh, of compensatory revenue um, count in a post free and reduced lunch form world. Um, we know um, that uh, currently um, the Medicaid direct certification um, plus um, SNAP and MPIP gets us to about 90% of the students that we intend to target with these dollars. Um, and the goal of this bill is to make sure that 100% of those kids are being counted. Um, this bill also works in a number of recommendations from the Office of the Legislative Auditor, um, because if we're doing one thing, we might as well do all the things that, that they have recommended um, that we think uh, collectively are a good idea. Um, so I will run through briefly what this bill does. Um, first and foremost, it is um, replacing the free and reduced lunch proxy um, with an additional formula. So um, this bill proposes that we rely on the Medicaid direct certification plus SNAP, MFIP, et cetera. Um, and then also add to that formula um, ELL up to 4%, um, high mobility numbers up to 2%, and um, collection of forms up to 4%. And uh, if we, as we continue the discussion, um, Tim Strom can explain that in more detail if folks would like. Um, but the goal here is to use um, those numbers from our ELL and our home mobility um, to get us again um, from 90% of the count that we're currently at to 100% of the count um, in a way that does not force schools to rely on free and reduced lunch forms exclusively that are going to be um, unnecessary because we are hopefully moving to universal meals. Um, so the, the explanation, just to give a little bit of detail, um, the ELL numbers we thought were a really good measure because they really do reflect the types of students that we are trying to target with these dollars. And they also may be underrepresented in the current numbers just because a lot of um, new American communities feel a little bit less comfortable sharing some of their information. And so we thought that information might be slightly harder to collect. Um, high mobility numbers are pretty well reflected in the Medicaid direct certification. So we cap that at up to 2%. Um, and then the forms um, are up to 4%. So we think that will get us to 100%. Um, but looking forward to input on that. Um, note that we did decided against using census data, which is like a really straightforward measure, but would become increasingly out of date over each decade. Um, also, it's not necessarily indicative of the student body makeup in a particular school. Um, and uh, there's another option that we considered, which would be to allow schools to collect free and reduced lunch forms all year round, which apparently would help us get those numbers up, but would kind of be a burden on schools. So we didn't, we decided not to go with that. So there are, there is a spreadsheet that I have with me of all the ways you could go about doing this. Um, we settled on our formula, but really open to input from this committee. Um, we also um, changed uh, the rule that the amount, the compensatory dollars currently have to be spent at least 50% at the generating site. Um, we raised that to 70%. Um, and the rationale is just that we want to make sure that these dollars that are targeting these specific students really are getting to the students who have generated that funding um, and are not diffused over the school district. Um, we also made some changes to the reporting requirements um, at the recommendation of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, specifically, um, 
schools are currently required to report how those dollars uh, tied to student achievement, which is kind of an impossible task and hard to quantify. So instead, we um, changed that to um, require schools to talk about um, the verification that the expenditures were uh, consistent with best practices. And connected to that, we ask MDE to identify best practices so that schools can benefit from that, um, that resource. Um, we eliminated the requirement that uh, the schools reserve a portion of their compensatory funding for extended time revenue or extended time programs. Um, and that, again, was a recommendation of the OLA. Um, we didn't do some really technical stuff that I won't talk about because we didn't do it in the end. Um, and then also, and I think a place where we'll want to spend a lot of time today in discussion is we looked at the 12 acceptable uses of compensatory revenue um, and we narrowed those accept acceptable uses in a way that is um, consistent with targeting students who really need to be most um, supported by these extra uh, expenditures or ex extra funding. So um, that is what the bill does. Um, and like I, I said, this is kind of the beginning of the conversation. I've had a lot of conversations with every colleague and stakeholder who would meet with me um, that a lot of people kind of wanted to see like what the bill looked like and then provide input. So um, this is our starting place. Um, I'm really happy with it. I'm proud of it. I think it, it is the it is reflects a lot of thought and work, but it's just the beginning of the conversation. And um, I'm excited to hear what everyone's thoughts are. And I'll be taking copious notes and probably watch the video again later. And I'll, I know that there are some members of the public who wanted to testify. All right. Thank you, Representative Feist. First up, I have Matt Schaefer. Chair Pryor, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Matt Schaefer. I'm a teacher and the policy director at Ed Allies. Happy Compensatory Revenue Day to you all. I'm here to testify in support of House File 1547 and want to thank Representative Feist for her multi-year leadership and vision in working to improve the best tool we have in Minnesota to equitably resource schools serving students in poverty. Ed Allies strongly supports Section 2, which is a thoughtful proposal to identify compensatory generating students that direct certification may not find. As a reminder, nearly all Minnesota students who qualify for free and reduced price meals, as well as generate compensatory revenue, do so through direct certification. We also support the narrowing and focusing of the uses of the funds as outlined in section three, keeping as much of the additional funds generated by students at the school site they attend, as noted in section four, and in section six, an effort to work toward phasing out the inaccurate and unnecessary use of paper forms for the purpose of compensatory revenue. I'm going to cede the rest of my testimony time because I know that there are members of the public who are parents, students, and educators who came here today hoping to testify on a subsequent bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next up, Sarah Burt. And please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Burt, lobbyist with Education Minnesota. We support the approach in House File 1547 to address the need for adjustments to the compensatory revenue formula. Through expanding the number of students that would be counted in the compensatory revenue formula to include measures beyond direct certification, this puts in place some mechanisms to ensure fewer kids will be missed um, in the state count as the state migrates to a new system of calculating compensatory revenue. Moving away from the system of collecting a paper form from families removes a key barrier to this funding getting to the buildings where students need the extra support. I've heard stories from some of our members that around the deadline for these forms to be turned in, they would take time after work to help the district reach these families. They were happy to pitch in because they knew how valuable it was to get an accurate count of families who would benefit from free and reduced price lunch. However, they're at capacity in their current roles and they'll be relieved to know their students will still be counted. The targeted uses of compensatory revenue in this bill will help further direct resources towards the opportunity gap from the earliest ages to high school students. We know the students in these school communities need extra support to reach the state standard level for achievement in core content areas. This bill directs funding at that area. We know these students need more individual instruction and this bill would fund that through funding more teachers and teaching aids, more team teaching, which will result in lower instructor to learner ratios. Directing funding into classrooms to ensure more individualized instruction 
is good for our students and is a crucial tool to retaining teachers. We also support the focus on funding programs that relate to reducing truancy and investments in meeting the social and emotional needs of our students through providing more school counselors, social workers, and guidance counselors. Thank you to Representative Feist for working on a targeted approach to directing resources to these students and the caring adults in their school communities. At the end of the day, there are public school students behind these numbers, and we really appreciate your strong advocacy for them. Thank you, Ms. Bird. Scott Kunkrist. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I can say your name. Just some days I have trouble getting it out. And please identify yourself for the records and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Scott Kroenquist. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Metropolitan School Districts. We represent 50 school districts and intermediate districts that collectively enroll more than half of the state's public school students. Uh, first, I want to thank Representative Feist very much for her work on House File 1547. Uh, she has been tireless in, in this endeavor in trying to solve uh, this critical issue. Compensatory revenue is a very important funding stream for our school districts. And actually for years now, we've tried to identify better metrics um, and move away from the very burdensome and kind of cumbersome collection of the uh, pre-reduced price lunch forms. Now, however, with the move towards universal meals, there is a real urgency to uh, go in this direction. Otherwise, we have school districts that will literally lose millions of dollars in compensatory revenue. Now, I know there's been some estimate that up to 90% of uh, eligible students could be identified through the direct certification. However, I will tell you that we recently completed a survey of our member districts, and we do have members that have indicated that 20% or more of their students will not be identified um, absent uh, the, the old method of um, filling out the form. And so that's why it's even more important that we move forward with um, a, a proposal like Representative Feist, House File 1547, and identify additional metrics. Uh, we have had a chance to get some very preliminary feedback from a few districts, and we think we still need to probably make a few tweaks, um, just because uh, some are indicating that they'll still come up a little bit short under the proposed method. Just one other quick issue, Madam Chair. Um, we do have a few districts that do have a problem with um, moving from the 50 to 70 percent of revenue being required at the site. Uh, we have a concentration formula that det determines compensatory. And thus, some um, buildings generate very little revenue, although they still have students with significant needs in those buildings. Um, but they will not have enough revenue at that site. If you continue to let your school boards have the ability to do, do a local plan, they can ensure that all students receive the resources and the services that they need. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Appreciate the time, and we appreciate Representative Feist's work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have no more testifiers on this particular bill. Um, so we will move to member discussion, and we welcome member discussion. Yes, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Representative Feist. I'm just, just wondering, you know, we, about uh, half of our students are grade level proficient in reading and fewer than half in math. Um, is there any correlation with the uh, uh, compensatory revenue programs and uh, doing anything to Im impact that? <laughs> Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just trying to go to where we talk about kind of the change in acceptable uses. Um, and definitely, um, we know that issues like, like literacy, as we, we talked about in our last committee hearing, um, are, are a critical issue for, for these low-income students. And I'll, I'll just read again kind of what the compensatory dollars are intended to target. It's designated funds to help students who are underprepared to learn and not meeting academic performance standards. So those are the students we're trying to provide these extra supports for. And so um, looking at the bill, we looked at line 4.28, and I believe this was in, in the existing list of 12 acceptable uses already. Um, but we talk about remedial instruction in reading, language arts, mathematics, and other content areas, or study skills to improve the achievement level of these learners. Um, I know when I was looking at this list, I thought about adding in literacy specifically, and I felt like it was kind of implicit. But if you do have input on how you think that we could better target like the acceptable uses to make sure that we are providing that extra like literacy and mathematics, like basic supports for these students, um, I would definitely be open to them. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Feist. I'm just you know, glad that you are focusing on that area uh, that 
you know, it's important to, to have positive outcomes based on, on the spending. Mm -hmm. Representative Mueller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Erdahl, for asking that question. Um, I guess I just have some concerns, and, and maybe it's just my ignorance because I was a classroom teacher and I wasn't in charge of having to do any of these any of this type of reporting that you are now changing. Um, it does say you you highlighted it in your testimony of 6.12. A district may also report when um, programs are funded with compensatory revenue are consistent with best practices demonstrated to improve student achievement, and you cross out levels. So I know you had Representative Erdahl look at the uses of compensatory funding. But we've had compensatory funding for years. And um, if we're not, and the purpose of it is to make sure that we're helping our students who are struggling and are not coming prepared, um, how will we know this is actually working if we remove <laughs> the specific reporting mechanism? Representative Feist. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, I think the way the language was written originally is basically impossible for an individual school to do. And that was why the Office of the Legislative Auditor really specifically said that that language should be changed. Um, they said, um, unreasonable requirement for determining impact. Although statutes require school districts to annually report compensatory revenues impact on student achievement, the requirement is unrealistic. Isolating the effects of a single revenue stream requires rigorous research methods that are at best impractical for school districts. And so that is why we changed this specific recording re requirement. Um, but I do agree that there should be some, like there should be mechanisms that we should support at the legislature to kind of understand like how our education budget works to impact student achievement to address the opportunity gap. And if you do have specific input on that line, like I'm very open to it, um, but that's why it's, it is the way it is. Great, thank you. Representative Mueller. Yeah, and maybe we can, thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe we can ask uh, nonpartisan staff to just, I don't know what this reporting was like before and what it's going to change to, and um, maybe that's something we need to talk about offline, but I know as a specific teacher, I'm able to record how things, and I hear what you're saying with the auditor of, you know, we can't specifically look at a specific revenue stream. I get that. But if that's what these are for, you know, if that's the purpose of these, then we better make sure that they are doing what they said they're doing. And I know as a teacher, I'm able to really look down very specifically on how my students are learning, how they're achieving. And so maybe if I could just throw that question to nonpartisan staff and let them give me a little bit more detail, that would be right. great. So, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, as Representative Feist highlighted for you, um, the way it was written in statute originally was to say it was this particular funding stream you have to show the result tied to that funding stream as opposed to everything else that your school district is doing. And I think that that's where um, the, the OLA report said that this was unrealistic to do. Um, is there a comment from um, nonpartisan staff that adds to this discussion at this point? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Mueller, I think you, you've captured the, the nature of the OLA uh, concerns with that. The, I, I believe por portions of the OLA report are in our packet here, but the, uh, uh, separately, why don't I make sure that uh, all the committee members have a link to that report and their discussion about why they thought that was uh, an unachievable way for the legislature to measure that. Mm -hmm. Representative Mueller. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, I, and I understand that. I, I just don't know what it was before and what it would be changed to and just to make sure that it actually is doing it. As I said, I understand what OLA is saying, and I thank you, Mr. Strom, for, for doing that. And, um, I, and Representative Mueller, I think your microphone is maybe oh, not. JK. Yeah, no, not, not, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I have I a teacher voice. You can't hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Surprising. No, and I, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strom, and I, and I appreciate that. As I said, uh, I don't know how it was recorded before, and I just wanted to know what it would look like 
after the recommendation has been has been uh, changed, just to know that we're seeing a correlation. Mm -hmm. so, right. Thank you, and we can check on that. <coughs> I appreciate that. Further, yeah, we I think I think that is a good one to follow up more in detail off, offline. And um, I, I'm uh, Representative you, Akeem. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to make note too for members that it will be coming to Ed Finance mm -hmm. um, because we will have an appropriation here that deals with the changing of the percentage to make up for um, the students that might be missed by the forms. Um, I'll have to ask about how that interacts with concentration because that's the first time I've heard about it and we've been talking about this for months. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how that works. Um, but no, I just wanted to point out, um, thank Representative Feist for pointing out the OLA report because that's what kind of kicked off this whole discussion in, uh, even before we were talking about universal mm -hmm. meals. It was kind of, they were kind of both happening at the mm -hmm. same time, but we knew that if we did one, we'd have to look at the other as well. So this has been a long process for you, and we've talked through a lot of like what's, what we've, um, how we're directing it. But I, I do, maybe it's just, maybe your answer on the reporting. I don't know if a school district's um, ready to come up and chat about it, but. From the way I'm reading this language, it actually gives you a little more flexibility on that reporting. So do you want to? Any? I'm seeing nods, but it'd be nice <laughs> to have it on record is what I'm saying. <laughs> Mr. Krunkrist, thank you <laughs> for coming forward. <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, Scott Kronquist with the Association of Metro School Districts. And yeah, Representative Yuakim, I, I agree. I, we think that is workable, the, the proposed language in the, in the legislation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, Representative Bakeberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Feist. Um, just a couple questions that I've gotten from people. Um, and and, and then Representative Feist, I think you and I have just briefly touched on this, but how do extracurricular activities play into this? Um, currently, it's my understanding the high school league uses, uses some of this for the, the classification for what level or what, what class uh, a school competes at. So, um, so I think that's, I don't expect an answer, but it's something to, that we need to be thinking about because a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of, Schools are asking about that, so. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Feist. Do, do you mind clarifying, actually? Because at first I thought you were talking about extended time programming, but I feel like that's not what you're talking about, and I want to make sure that I and the committee understands. Yeah, so what I'm, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Representative Bakeberg. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, like, my uh, local school district competes in football at 5A. Um, there's a there's a factor in the the level whether they're 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, or 5A, um, and part of that is um, is free and reduced. So there's a lot of buzz about how right. that is. And then so if I may um, clarify your questions for my understanding um, and to understand the work that we're doing. They use the free and reduced yes. lunch. They don't directly go to the compensatory formula, but, and I think um, what Representative Feist and I have talked about that Representative Feist is working on is finding out the other places in statute that reference using that measure of the free and reduced lunch um, as opposed to what we also have right now, which is um, direct certification as a means. And so we know that this doesn't solve all of the issues related to, um, it, this is a huge one and it's the most important, but we have some more work to do also if we're not requiring those forms. And I'll let uh, Representative Feist also, because it's, it's another bill, uh, Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, that is like my side hobby <laughs> these days is figuring out all the ways that free and reduced lunch forms manifest in, in our schools and elsewhere um, and, and kind of figuring out what we can do as a legislature to address them. So I would love to talk with you about that some more. Right, and I'm hoping that that with some good work you can be a co-author because you'll know that it's the bill <laughs> that's getting the job done in a way that really serves 
the purpose that we have right now for free and reduced <coughs> lunch, but that we move forward and move beyond those forms. And as Representative Feist noted, schools know right now that we're not really reaching everybody we want to reach with that form right now in our system that we're using. So it's an area, no matter what, um, that we'd be looking to try to improve on and would really um, invite your participation on that. So thank you, Representative Big, for bringing that up in this context. Yeah. Just one more quick Yes. Question. Please thank, proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the concerns that was brought up from, um, from some of the superintendents that I talked with about it was professional development no longer being tied into it. Mm -hmm. So maybe just something um, to talk about because in order to implement things with fidelity, mm -hmm. uh, the professional development is, is critical and we can have the best program, but if we don't train our teachers, our kids aren't going to learn. In the end of the day with this money, we want our kids to learn and grow. So mm -hmm. PD is a really important piece. All right. Thank you, Representative Bigberg. And I think that's um, an excellent point to be raising on the policy committee. And I, and I hope that if, if we don't get it solved um, and that it's something that we finish working on in the, in the ed finance, that that's acceptable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a comment? Uh, Representative Feist. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I definitely, um, I appreciated our email exchange and definitely, um, I can, I can wait until side conversation then. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I appreciate that input. Um, I think that I would love to have conversation with you about the professional development and how we can make sure that it is, it is professional development that kind of supports the mission of these specific dollars. Um, but I definitely agree that that is an important just part of the big picture, mm -hmm. making sure all students are supported. So, Thank you. Representative Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, first, I want to thank Representative Feist for carrying this bill. I represent a school district that was very happy. We uh, passed numerous uh, meals, but they were also concerned about uh, the compensatory aid portion. So thank you for carrying this. Um, I, I just, yeah, want, want to say that. And then um, the other piece is, um, you know, I, I love the conversation about um, making sure that we um, are cutting back on, on paperwork and streamlining the uh, administrative piece of this. Um, if we'll, we'll, you know, if the committee members will recall um, our discussion on Representative Jordan's bill, um, you know, had a, um, I think a, a current parent who was a child in a family that, um, you know, would have qualified for free lunch had her parent um, been able to fill out the form. And so um, I think getting rid of this this paper process means that we're able to help those students who, who need the aid the most. And I mean, obviously, it's, it's a fairness uh, question for schools and school districts that serve these students. Um, and obviously, also like the meals, we get to feed the students, right? But um, you know, I, 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 I love that like this bill actually ensures that we capture everyone who we're missing because as we all know, um, the beginning of the school district is a very chaotic time for teachers, parents, and students alike. And, um, you know, if you are a parent that would benefit from aid like this, right, or would qualify, you're probably working, you know, two jobs and you don't have time for this extra piece. So thank you. Uh, Representative Bennett. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thanks, Representative Feist, for addressing compensatory funding. I, this is important, um, and I think some of the changes in here are good, changing how, uh, you know, getting rid of the paper pencil type things and getting on into the electronic world, making that easier for schools and so on. That's very important. Um, two issues, though, that I see here, one, one being that we are actually increasing the revenue disparities between school districts when we're making these changes um, to where, and I'll just give you an example. Um, so in FY23, the statewide average for compensatory revenue per pupil was about $562, and um, that's per pupil. Sure. For Minneapolis and St. Paul, 1,506. With this new certification max, um, the statewide per pupil is $896, Minneapolis, 2,096. So we are inadvertently creating more disparities between rural schools and metro schools and even amongst metro schools, and I think we need to look at that more closely. But even more, and I'd just like to add this, um, I always think, and this is maybe a funding issue more for the funding committee, but I'll say that in the... 
additional funding is, is awesome, but we need to make sure it's smart funding. And I guess my question is, has compensatory funding actually improved academics over the last, it's been 20 years since we had major funding overhaul for this program. And I don't see the evidence that it has improved anything. Um, reading scores over the last 20 years have gone down, 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 math. And then same with our achievement gap has grown over that time. <coughs> and so I think we need to look at here, um, is it accomplishing what we want to? And if it's not, we should tweak it. I'm not saying get rid of the program, but not just tweak it, but make some innovative changes. Like perhaps we could just give di districts more opportunity and flexibility for innovation. Tell them that we want this is intended for promoting academic achievement, lifelong learning, and then leave it to them to determine and target those students as to how they're going to use that funding. Because what we're doing now with this money is not working, and simply putting more money into it, that's not going to solve the problem either. We're, we need to make some core changes. So I would just add that I would love to see more innovation allowed, more flexibility for school districts so that we're smartly funding and not simply funding. Thank you. Right. Thank you, and I've been misreading the signals here. Um, we do have two more people that would like to speak, but appreciate your comments. Um, any, any specific uh, reply, Representative Feist? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, I have a few thoughts in response. Um, the first is just that um, equal is not necessarily equitable, and so the kind of point of having compensatory revenue is that we have identified certain students that do need extra investment and support. And so I just wanted to make that point. Um, the second point you made, I love. And I actually, when we were thinking about compensatory revenue and what we wanted to do here, um, one of the questions I kind of threw out there is, do we want to like, 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 like right now we're just like, what is the proxy? Let's find a better proxy that's more workable and gets us to like 100% of what we want. Um, but do we want to rethink <laughs> compensatory revenue and, um, and, and what we want to achieve with this portion of our education budget, which is very significant? Um, we decided not to tackle that this year, but I'd be very interested in continuing the conversation um, because I do think that it's worth thinking about. Um, I will point out, lastly, that, I mean, the, the Office of the Legislative Auditor did like a really deep dive. Like, I think the full report's like 100 pages. And I've got their key recommendations here. And, you know, none of their recommendations were like, throw it out, like this is dumb, <laughs> like it's not achieving anything. So, I mean, I, I assume that if the OLA thought that compensatory revenue was like a terrible, terrible idea, that that would have been part of their key recommendations is just, just like rethink this whole huge part of our education budget, and they didn't say that. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of states, I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many states have a compensatory revenue-esque part of their education budget, but it is a lot of them. So, so I, I think that it comes from a place that is data-driven, um, but I, I also don't think that we should just assume because we've done it this way for a while that we should just keep doing the same thing. Um, so, so yeah, I appreciate your comments. I just have a follow-up, Madam Chair, since we're on this rolling. And thank you. And I, I'd love to work with you on that. Just uh, thinking outside the box, I think, is good. And I am not advocating um, jettisoning this program. But I am saying that we really need to look at, is it working? Because we should always be asking that. And this is the perfect committee to ask, how can we make it work better? Mm -hmm. and, and measuring input, you know, what's, how much money we're giving for this type of student, that type of student is not what we should really be focusing on. We should be focusing on the outcomes, and I'm not seeing the outcomes showing that the input is really working. So um, at this, with this bill right now, I have a difficult time supporting it. If we can add more innovation and, and try to make this, whatever, work better, then I would be more in support. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I say um, Thanks. I, I would be really happy. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I'd be happy to talk. I think the acceptable uses portion here is where that conversation should live. So I'd be happy to continue that conversation. Thanks. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry for the confusion. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> on, on that. No. Representative Feist, thank you for bringing this bill. I got to tell you about 
a month ago now, I was speaking to a room full of educators, and they were excited about the idea of all students having universal access to, to breakfast and lunch. And they were also concerned, as President Lee mentioned, about um, not being able to capture those students with this compensatory aid. And I said, we've got some smart people at the legislature, and there's somebody <laughs> working on this, and they thought about this. So thank you for making me right. I appreciate that, and good job on this. Uh, just one of, the, one of the questions I had uh, was in reference to what uh, Representative Bennett said about creating this, increasing this gap between the, the funding, um, because now we're going to be capturing more folks. And, and, and part of me, I think, that points out one of the issues that we really have, right? We've got high levels of concentrated poverty in certain areas and certain districts within our state. And, and largely, it's in the metro area, because that's where a lot of people live, right? So is that correct? Is that we're, seeing, we're going to see an increase because we're going to see more money flow because of those high levels of poverty concentrated in those particular school districts. Is that correct? Representative Feist. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the way the formula works is it, is it has that concentration formula or as concentration factor. Um, and so where there are higher levels of poverty, then then it's not just dollar for dollar. There is like a compression, like you get more, yeah. um, up to 80%. Yeah. Um, and I will mention that we looked at that 80% cap and we considered eliminating it um, and decided that that would not be equitable when looking at statewide funding, and so so we made the decision not to do that. Um, so so I think, but it, but it absolutely does target more dollars based on high concentrations of poverty, and there is a reason for that. It's because we know those schools need that extra level of yeah. support um, and funding. So if we eradicate poverty, we don't have this issue, do we? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Let's do that, too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. That's innovative thinking. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chair Kim, did you have another comment for us? Uh, thank you, or Madam question. Chair. And actually, more kind of a question, because I know you've done a deep dive into this, Representative Feist. We've, um, when we do formulas and do correlations, and it's for a calculation for need, not necessarily, like you said, dollar for dollar. So this is just a way to look at what are some of the indicators that have been scientifically proven to show that we're having kids fall behind and they need this intensive help. So is, is, am I right on that? Because you've studied this even more than I have. Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Yes. That is the point of these dollars, um, is to target students who are underprepared to learn. Um, and to give you an example of a metric that we considered that's totally impractical, but I think really highlights the types of students we're trying to reach, is the, the level of education of a parent is actually a really good correlation with the types of students who might need this extra support. Um, and so, so we really are targeting students who are you know, maybe experiencing generational poverty, um, have language barriers, um, and, and so we want to, to target these dollars strategically. And, um, and I do think that um, this provision that asks the Department of Education to, to be a resource around best practices that are designed to reach those students, to help them um, to, to achieve, um, to address the opportunity gap. I think that will be really meaningful. Um, and, and I do really look forward to the conversation around acceptable uses, because we really do want to make sure that we don't, like this, we don't want this to just be part of the education budget that's spent on toilet paper and tampons. Um, but um, you know, we want it to be really targeting um, students who like are having challenges with literacy, math, um, you know, who, who need those extra supports. And we just don't, we don't want it to be just like part of the bottom line general fund for a school. Madam Chair, just quick follow up. Chair, you came. And I, I, I did reread that OLA report, the executive summary, and you are tackling four of the five key recommendations. So thank you for that. And maybe I can just ask a question um, just to prepare maybe Representative Bennett offline. We don't have a fiscal note or runs for this. So the numbers that you were stating and the disparity, we haven't even gotten a fiscal note on it. So I'd be curious to find out where you got those numbers. But mm -hmm. that can be done offline. Thank right. you. And we look forward to the education finance discussion of this, too. Uh, closing comments, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the really great conversation. As I said, you know, like for me, the most important thing here, um, at, like the most important urgent thing is that we make sure that schools receive the funding that they need, the compensatory revenue that they have, that they rely upon. Um, and, and so um, that is what this bill seeks to achieve. But I think that 
that um, looking at the acceptable uses and the other policy tweaks that we've made, I think this is an important step forward. And um, I would uh, hope you all can support it. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Feist. And, and thank you for the work that you've done on this. I think a lot of people have recognized that this is something um, for various reasons and now is comp particularly compelling um, that we had to take a look at make a change now, um, even as we keep revisiting it and, and try to direct our um, dollars to where they have the biggest impact on, on the students that are, have the greatest need. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, so I will uh, re renew Representative Feist's motion to re-refer House File 1547 to the Education Finance Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. All right. Um, the ayes have it. and. Uh, our bill is moving to education finance. Thank you, Representative Weiss. <laughs>